Well, I think uh, it would be fair to say if there's one set of leitmotifs that keep coming up uh, at gatherings like this, it's China and climate change. And curiously, these two very sort of dynamic issues have a angle of repose together in an almost married state. And I want to tease this out a little to explain to you what I mean by that, because I think they pose some very immense problems, challenges, and also some, some opportunities. Uh, I have a friend that when uh, asked uh, how he's doing, he says that he's in between transitions. And I think that would accurately describe China. It is proverbially in between transitions. And this is so because its present system of government was set back in the 50s when Stalin was still alive and the Comintern was still operative. And since then, it's been kind of undergoing, well, I would hate to use this analogy, but it is an apt one, something of a sex change operation. It is a system set down during the heyday of Marxism, Leninism, the institutions still survive, and yet the market is entered and really run away with a large part of what China is. Uh, and it has created this very curious sort of hybrid system that some refer to as market Leninism. And as uh, Pete Lydon suggested, the successes are enormous and to be esteemed. Uh, indeed, if you were someone such as myself who was standing in front of the gate of heavenly peace in 1989, just before June 4th, looking at a million people flowing into Tiananmen Square, you wouldn't have imagined that China would be where it is today, and yet it is. But where it is today, uh, despite all its extraordinary success and growth, uh, is very perilously balanced. And it is perilously balanced not only for China, but insofar as China relates to the rest of the world, and insofar as we, throughout this new global existence that we live, are bound ineluctably to one another. Uh, not just through trade, not just through all the things you think of uh, of a rather mundane kind, but of course through our common shared atmosphere. And this is where these two common themes of the dynamism and the reemergence of China and the challenge of climate change converge. Now let's just back up a bit and let me give you just a few thoughts about why China uh, is as successful as it is and why it plays such an extraordinarily important role in the whole creation of the climate change problem and potentially in the resolution of this problem. China, like the US, contributes 20% of the global carbon emissions to the atmosphere. In this, we're, we have a certain parity. And curiously, this sets the stage for, I think, a rather healthy dialogue and a healthy discussion and possibly uh, even some sort of a major collaboration on this front. Because in fact, we are both equally responsible for this dilemma. And so nobody comes in in a position capable to preach to the other. So just file that thought away. At the heart of this matter, of both matters indeed, of China's dynamism, economic growth, and the challenge of climate change lies coal. 70% of all of China's energy comes from coal. Until 1993, China was uh, energy sufficient, at least oil sufficient. That has changed radically. One reason we're now looking at $4 gasoline a gallon, uh, and that oil is over $100 a barrel is because China has greater petroleum needs than ever before. Not much more is being produced, more is being asked for, the price is going up. This means something to China and to us that is very similar, rely on coal. You've probably all seen the ads in the newspapers, full pagers, there's an electrical plug, there's a big block, big chunk of black coal and the plug is going to go right into that chunk of coal. And the headline says something about, you know, energy, independence, liberty, freedom, all these good things. All is going to 
derive from that nexus between coal and that electrical wire? Well, in a certain sense, that's right. As oil gets more expensive, we depend on coal. China's coal happens to be extremely dirty. But that's just one problem. You have to visualize the problem of coal in two parallel streams of problem. One is dirty air. And you've been to Beijing, most of you, I'm sure. You know there are relatively few blue sky days, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, mercury, all of the things which come out of the burning of coal, particularly soft coal, dirty coal, particularly when the scrubbers are not uh, installed or turned off because they're too expensive to run. That's one track. And that's the track you see, you feel, that causes 750,000 people annually in China to die prematurely from pollution. Roughly 500,000 of those are due to air pollution. The other track, of course, is completely unseen. That is, the taking of carbon out of the ground, burning it, combusting it, putting up a flue into the atmosphere. And that is, of course, the uh, creation of greenhouse gases, which are raising temperatures and causing all of the untoward effects with which many of you are familiar. But let me suggest a few for China. China used to think that the whole climate change racket was something being foisted by the developed nations on undeveloped nations whose time had come to join in the spoils of development, to raise standards of living, completely understandable the justifiable demand for the right to develop and to participate in the consumer life and a raised standard of living. And that, who can deny that right to anyone? More recently, though, they've been confronting a whole host of things that have started to happen within their country that have caused the leadership, in many ways, to be more alarmed and proactive than our own. Now, there's a paradox here. In our country, you look at the pyramid standing upright. At the top, the executive office, the president. You get down a little bit lower, you get to the states, to the cities, and on down the line. Consciousness is weakest at the top of the pyramid when it comes to climate change in our country. It's not until you get down to the states, uh, to the cities, that you find some very innovative and creative programs going on. Then you get down into civil society, and it's veritably a cauldron of bubbling activity. In fact, one of the great sadnesses of coming to meetings like this is the number of incredibly intelligent people with brilliant ideas, energy, education, activist bent, and they're all working for NGOs and being, you know, more or less ignored. Now, if you look at China, you find a pyramid that's standing on its head. You find the leadership at the top very well acquainted with this problem, very intelligent, apprised, uh, fearful, uh, and I think in many ways starting to be proactive. There's a word, an expression, a slogan in Chinese now. It's called scientific development. Well, it used to be the slogan was development. So what's the scientific mean? You might skid right over this if you read the 17th Party Congress's address by President Hu Jintao, a rather turgid document, but it means something. It means the environment. It means we no longer can develop without paying heed to the environmental consequences of development. And they know this is the case because they're beginning to see alarming instances of aberrant and changing weather patterns. The North China Plain, for instance, has been undergoing a really severe drought. If you've ever traveled across the North China Plain, you go on these magnificent new expressways, beautiful bridges built over these rivers. Uh, goes on and on and on. Lo lovely landscape, tree planting along the edges, green, you know, uh, uh, efforts to, 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 to make green these freeway right-of-ways. The only problem is you'll pass river after river after river, not a drop of water in them. Even the Yellow River, China's sorrow, as it was once known, most years ceases to debouch out into the ocean at all. It's all the water is taken out through irrigation, industrial use, uh, through dams, one thing and another. There is a crisis of water in the breadbasket of China on the North China Plain. And yet, last summer, 
in the city of Jinan in Shandong province, near where Confucius uh, was born and, and held forth. They had a storm, the likes of which no recorded record in Chinese history, and believe me, in Shandong province, that record goes back several millennia. And there was a photo I saw in a newspaper uh, of the airport, and it was a picture of about 50 people pushing a jet aircraft through a lake. The lake happened to be at the airport. And so we encountered this very anomalous situation of a flood during a time of drought. And of course, the water just all ran off, and that was that. And the drought continued. Not too much earlier, there was an instance in South China, in, in the city of Zhanjiang, not far from Guangdong, uh, from uh, Canton, uh, Guangzhou. And uh, there, in a 24-hour period, I don't know if anyone wants to hazard a guess. It's, uh, uh, you'll never, never guess, so let me just tell you how many inches of rain fell. 29 inches of rain. They'd never seen anything like this. You go up on the Tibetan Plateau now, which used to be this wonderful blank space on the map of no consequence that only romantics lusted after. We thought it was one place didn't really have any significance to anybody except maybe the Dalai Lama, the Tibetans, and Buddhists. Well, it turns out that the Tibetan Plateau is, of course, as we now know, the water tower of all the great river systems of Asia. The Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Mekong River, the Salween, the Brahmaputra, you could go on and on and on. They all find their headwaters on the Tibetan Plateau, and their headwaters derive from glacial ice during non-monsoon times. And the annual melt of these glaciers now, and you see many different figures, but one which seems as accurate as any, is 7% per annum. Figure the actuarial table out on that. And then ask yourself, what's going to happen to the however many billion people, three billion people of Asia, who depend on Tibet, it turns out, for water? China's answer to this, well, they're very alarmed. The leaders are very, very disturbed by what they're seeing. Not only are the glaciers melting, the permafrost is thawing out, and they're finding altered weather patterns in the grasslands on the sort of steppes of the Himalayas to the north, whereby they're getting heavy storms for short periods of time, not long-term light rain such as they used to get on this very fragile grassland area. This is grass that over the millennia has developed to need sustained irrigation uh, after wintertime. It's not getting it, and the grass is dying because it comes in flash floods, disappears, and the root structures of the grass die. The permafrost is melting, and that changes the whole ability of the land to retain water, release water, and also to provide uh, uh, headwaters for these various rivers that, that arise in this area. Very alarming. Now, these are just a couple of the things that one learns to great consternation about the challenges arising from China's development, which grow out of the use of coal. Now, unless you think this is just China's problem, uh, remember this. 23% of all the pollution that China produces, and believe me, it produces a lot, is made by goods manufactured for you, so that you can go to Walmart stock up on the weekend, run your credit card through the roof so that China can buy treasury bills. We have a 1% savings rate in this country. Chinese savings rate is somewhere between 40 and 50%. It's quite an interesting relationship we have with China here, rather dysfunctional, not one that even with counseling one would expect to last uh, very long. And indeed, I think we're running into the, into the latter stages of this relationship, but, being able to hang together. And so, we have China, its extraordinary dynamism. We have the United States, the most wealthy, powerful nation of the world, having abdicated leadership, a leadership role. And we have a common problem, carbon. China's emissions of carbon don't carry passports. They don't stay in China, nor do ours. 
We talk about trade, we argue about outsourcing jobs to China, we don't talk about outsourcing pollution to China. We talk about Taiwan, Tibet, we have many issues. We don't really yet have, between our two great nations, a common interest. And this is a very, uh, a very sort of prominent absence when it comes to us surviving the various altercations that arise uh, on the surface. Now, it strikes me that the common interest is, in fact, uh, the atmosphere and our common survival uh, on this earth. Whether we like it or not, we are bound at the hip together in this. If the US and China cannot get together on the question of climate change, cannot get in the game, there is no game. And it does not matter what Europe does. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. It's basically over. So that puts our relationship in a very different cast. It also, I think, suggests that if we're looking at sort of trans transformational issues, surely this very potent combination of China and climate has to be at the head of the list. Fortunately, as I intimated, it has a positive possible conclusion. In other words, even though it is a dire circumstance which we both confront, if we can confront it successfully, it could have a very salutary effect, not only on the climate in which we all live, but indeed on the relationship between the US and China uh, as well. And it strikes me that in this, which is undoubtedly the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. In this relationship, the United States has really lost its way in terms of leading. We have reacted, but we've forgotten how to lead. And if we ever needed, I think, some new energy, some new insights, some new imagination, some new thinking at this transformational moment, it would certainly be how to deal with China, how to lead China out of that part of itself, which is still rooted in the Leninist, Stalinist period of the 50s. How to help it transform in ways that it very inchoately and fearfully, I think, would like to evolve out of. But it's very difficult for it to do it alone. And it's very difficult for China to imagine at the same time that it's struggling to keep legitimacy by keeping economic growth rates, were, which were up around 11% last year, uh, going, uh, and not creating social disturbance by having economic cutbacks and a, and a whole uh, diminution in the growth of GDP. It's very hard for them to imagine dealing with this uh, alone, even for themselves. But in fact, it isn't just for themselves. So it seems to me that we're presented here at this very uh, epic moment in history with a truly transformational opportunity. And it's not one where noblesse oblige should be the theme, where we give to the poor benighted Chinese who are backward and uncivilized and need to get more democratized or whatever. No, I think that's something from the other side of this transformational divide but as equal partners. And yes, they do need to democratize. And yes, they do need to continue to develop. And I think, finally, as we approach a new president, and we, the Asia Society, have a whole initiative to try to bring this about, what we need is a roadmap for bringing the US and China together on this question of climate change. How can China continue to keep a reasonably rapid rate of development going at the same time that it doesn't harm itself and hurt all the rest of us to boot. That's the challenge. And I don't think it's an unthinkable one. If these two countries, perhaps with Japan allied, were to pool management skills, technology transfers, capital, uh, all of the other things which venture capital, all of the incredible dynamism that remains as yet, I think, untapped in an organized way. If our government and the Chinese government could get together and put out the call, 
to rally the forces which do make this country a great one, I have absolutely no doubt that we could prevail in this, this great challenge. No doubt at all. I mean, look at the venture capitalists in my home state of California. They're tripping all over themselves, even without a carbon tax, even without carbon caps, to get into the green energy market. Even the oil companies are stampeding and, and do it. I was at a meeting in Davos of the Glen Eagles group that Tony Blair uh, began of, I can't remember how many corporations, 30, 40, 70, I can't remember, all writing a letter to the governments of the world saying, folks, please set the terms of the game so we know how to make money and we won't be surprised. Please regularize what it is we have to do. We'll find out how to make money if you will set the rules, but just don't keep them vague and mysterious. So I think this is something of, a, of, a, of an opportunity. Uh, I would like to think that, and there's a good chance, I believe, that a new president in this country uh, would rise to this occasion. Uh, I think that leadership in China is also becoming ripe for this sort of an alternative. They be are beginning to understand it. But as one Chinese friend said to me, he said, you know, uh, you have to get out of the way, and what he meant by that was start to lead, so that we can't use you as an excuse for doing nothing. And that's what's happening. We're hiding behind them, they're hiding behind us. China signed the Kyoto Protocols, but it's a developing country, no defined limits. The U.S. signed it after Al Gore, in his sort of pre-heroic era, signed it. And then, of course, the present administration unsigned it. I don't know of any time when a treaty has been unsigned, but perhaps there were other occasions. Well, we're coming to the end of that, that regime, and I think we have to start preparing for what's to come. All of the present presidential candidates, I think, are disposed to do something about this. I don't think they quite know what to do about it either. So, in a sense, uh, I think of all of the issues that I've heard discussed here today, and they all, in a curious way, play into this one. This really will be the challenge of this next generation, to see if we can find some new basis, some new angle of repose, in the Sino-US bilateral relationship that might lead to involvement at a multilateral level and at the same time do something about climate change, which I think uh, it will not uh, solve itself uh, on its own accord. It's going to need a lot of help. But it is true that when people do put their mind to something, particularly Americans, uh, they can be very efficacious. So although I'm a little pessimistic, I'm not totally so. But if we cannot do anything in the next two or three years, then I think it will be too late. So there is a moment here. Uh, I'm not sure whether I expect you to leap out of your seats and grab a pitchfork and go to the barricades. I'm not quite sure what to ask anybody to do. But um, each in your own way, perhaps, uh, you will figure something out. And if we can prevail in these, these challenges of the relationship with China and climate change, I do think we would find uh, the world a different place and certainly this very important relationship between us and China uh, transformed in ways that I fully believe would make all of these other problems much more readily solvable at least not so disturbing when they arise.